Hi, I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf and welcome to my podcast, Cleaning Up the Mental Mess. This is part seven in a series of basic concepts that I'm teaching, that I'm helping people to understand about what I teach. So go watch the other six before you watch this. Well, watch this and then watch the other six, but everything kind of builds on each other. So today I'm going to talk about the concept of neuroplasticity. And that's something that most people have heard of at this stage. And there's, most people have a sort of level of understanding, but I want to just talk about how this has changed over time and how it really can apply to our own lives and just how incredibly exciting neuroplasticity is. So way back when, when I was studying, back in the early 80s, I was sitting in a neurology lecture because neuroscience in the 80s wasn't even a degree yet. It was, we were learning about the science of the brain, but as a formal degree, we actually got our training from neurologists and so on to help us understand the brain and anatomists and so on. So I was sitting in, in a neurology lecture and the professor said, and the, it basically said, when you'd work with your patients, the brain can't change. So you need to just teach them to compensate. So you just have to basically help them to kind of walk their way around this, to compensate. And immediately I was aware, my warning signals were going off and I was thinking, this can't be right. Our brain has to be able to change. And that was the going philosophy of the day in the 80s and really right up until the late 80s, early 90s, it was believed that the brain could not change. So it was if the brain was damaged, and here I have a mo my model of the brain, if there was damage in the brain from whatever, a stroke or traumatic brain injury or something like that, that was it. And basically you couldn't change it. So you just had to teach your patients to compensate. And I remember putting up my hand and saying to that professor, I can't see that this is, there must be, the brain must be able to change because we change as humans. We grow, we learn from our experiences. We have negative experiences and we get through them. We improve our, ourselves. We keep learning new information. We in university learning new information. And the professor said to me that, well, that's a ridiculous question, but you know, if you want to take it further, go and do some research. I actually did a TEDx talk on this. So if you want to go and see my, just Google TED Talks, Dr. Caroline Leaf. And anyway, so I did. I took up the challenge and I remember asking him, well, what is the area that is in, what would you recommend? What area should I go and research to show that your brain can change? And the professor said to me, well, the area of traumatic brain injury, which we used to call closed head injury, is an area that you know, there just was so little research in the 80s, 70s and 80s on traumatic brain injury, closed head injury, what to do, what it meant, etc. that there was literally a dearth of information. And this professor said, well, why don't you go, you know, research about traumatic brain injury? So I looked into it and I started my research journey way back then, working with people with head injuries. And I started off with me, uh, de developing systems, trying to understand what is mind and what's the connection between the mind and the brain and what's the difference and was doing research on that area. And then I developed, gave birth to the system that I now call the neurocycle. Initially, it was through trial and error, just trying to understand how could I help someone to learn and, and change the brain. One of my very first patients was someone who had a traumatic brain injury because that's the area I decided to research. And while I was actually preparing the systems and learning about them, People heard that I was doing this and a family approached me and their child had been in a terrible car accident and they asked if I would work with this particular student. And I actually ended up turning it into my master's research and from then I'd worked with you know, hundreds of other patients since. And what was very exciting for me was that I remember them coming to me and I remember saying that, you know, this is very early research, I can't guarantee anything, but we can certainly work together and see what happens. And so this particular patient who had a terrible car accident, was in a coma for longer than eight hours, in fact, for two weeks, and basically had been written off as a vegetable by the, the medical people, the doctors and neurologists that were working with the family. But the family didn't give up. They were determined to fight back. They did. They kept stimulating her. And they contacted me, I think it was more or less 12 to 14 months after the accident, when this particular person was actually had come out the coma, and was functioning at a sort of second, third grade, fourth grade level. And some of you may have heard me tell the story again, but it's quite amazing because this particular person was so determined, this particular patient in the study, in this, in this, in that I used in my research, when their parents came to me, the family was unreal, the environment was unreal. So this huge amount, we've got to always consider environment when it comes to neuroplasticity. But the point I want to make here is that this 
family was determined. They immersed them in support. And this particular young girl was so, so determined to come out of that coma. She actually heard people talking in the hospital at certain points as she was going through the stages of recovery, even when they thought she was in a coma. And anyway, she came out of it and by the t- she was determined to go back to school. And at that stage, she was 16 at the time of her accident. And when they contacted me, her peer group, had she'd lost pretty much almost the whole year. So her peer group were going into their last year of school, the second, almost the end of, ni- of the second last year of school, going, preparing for the last year of school. So we had to catch up a year in literally eight months and get to get her back into her goal, which was to go and finish, go back into school with her peer group and finish school. And in South Africa, you call that matric, final year at school. Anyway, long story short, we started working together three days a week, a couple of hours each time. And I say this to say that there's not enough time to overcome things on your own. It's not enough time. You have to work at this daily. So that she was determined, her family was determined, and they worked at this daily. They worked daily. And within a short period of time, we started seeing massive changes. She started progressing from second grade through fourth, third grade, four, and she just started climbing. And then it was an exponential climb. It was slow and then just this exponential climb. And what I had taught her to do was the initial stages of the neurocycle, which at that stage I called the five-step process. And it actually was four steps at that stage. And as of the years, I, I realized it was actually five steps. And we used her academic schoolwork because that was what she was determined to learn how to use. How, how to, she, wanted, she wanted to master her academics and finish school. Long, 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 long story short, eight months later, she went back into her peer group, back into, finished matric with her peer group. What was super interesting is that she graduated with incredibly good grades. She battled with math before her accident with brain damage and her brain damage healing. She actually ended up getting better math grades than before her accident. And all kinds of things like that happened. Her cognitive, social, emotional, academic, everything just changed so dramatically. And there's... As a, there were still physical things and so on. I, so this was some of the first work being done in neuroplasticity in the field. And so I was one of the first in my field to show that when you stimulate the brain, you can actually, when you stimulate the brain using the mind in a very deliberate and intentional way, you can change the brain. And then I started applying that with all kinds of patients that I was working with, stroke victims and traumatic brain injury, other traumatic types of traumatic brain injury all kinds of people that were battling with learning issues. It was extreme situations, extreme trauma. And I started developing the system more, developing a theory, constantly doing my research. I even went, did years and years of working with people with socially and socially deprived situations in the apartheid era where ac- academically, economically, politically, there was that terrible separation, time of separation, and, pe- and there was such poor education and such bad treatment of you know, all the racism and so on. And... I spent years learning that if you deliberately and intentionally understand your mind and drive your mind and manage your mind and grow your mind, you automatically will grow your brain. You will change your brain. Your brain is never the same. And that is neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is one of the most hopeful things. As I saw changes in my patients over the years and working in academic environments, training physicians, working with people in Rwanda after the genocide, a few years after the genocide, working with patients from the wealthiest to the poorest families, adults, children, there wasn't a situation that I didn't see where when you help someone to understand, to to tune into their mind, to tune into the warning signals, to, to, to read and tune in with their emotions and behaviors and all the warning signals I've been speaking about and manage those and drive them in the right direction, you see the changes in people. And a huge part of the work of neuroplasticity and change, which was, which is very easy to see, is if you take something that you're trying to learn, like this particular student in my master's research, which I then took into my PhD and did research with hundreds of people and so on, was a quick, very quick way to experience neuroplasticity that's very, very encouraging to help you in an emotional situation is to apply it in a learning environment first. So I initially had developed this to help people to build their brain and to grow stuff in their brain using academics. And then that translated over into the emotional side and then developed it more to help people with the emotional side. So the neurocycle that is in my app and in my Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess book basically deals with how to use the neurocycle to drive neuroplasticity in the right direction. So to drive these plastic changes in your brain because your brain is plastic. Or in this book, I have a book called Think, Learn, Succeed 
that is actually on the table behind me. And that's where I document how to use it to learn. We're building all of that into the app as well. So the point here, neuroplasticity is not going to happen if you're dead. But if you're alive, your brain is changing. We now know from the mid-90s with the advent of fMRI technology and the different types of technology that we have, spec scans, MRI, and so on. QEG since the 1920s, actually, we saw changes in the brain. Essentially, we we now know neuroplasticity is an accepted fact. In in fact, in every second person who talks about the brain will talk about neuroplasticity. But the fact is that it has to be driven. So your brain is going to change whether you like it or not. So one of the key issues is the plastic paradox. And that is that your brain is going to change anyway. So if you don't drive the changes, it could change in the wrong direction. And then you can wire in unmanaged thoughts, chaos into your brain and in your body and into your mind because memory inside thoughts are stored in your brain as thought trees, in your body as changes in your cells and in your mind as gravitational fields, as I've been explaining in this in this series and I explain on the podcast and in my materials. So therefore, if something comes up and it is a toxic issue and you don't manage it, it will actually go sink back into the non-conscious mind even more toxic than before. So the minute you're aware of something and you don't manage it, it gets stronger because the minute you're aware, it starts changing. So by the mere fact that you think about it and you think about it but you don't change it into a ma- manage it and deconstruct it and reconstruct it to try and make it work for you, not against you, it'll go back stronger than before. So if you are worrying about if there's some kind of pattern in your life that indicates a trauma and it keeps popping up but you keep pushing it down, it's going back stronger each time. And that's the plastic paradox. But if you allow it to come up and you allow yourself to go through the process of deconstructing and reconstructing, that whatever happened is not going to go away. That What happened to that patient, that trauma, that car accident didn't go away. The, all the things that, that, that maybe an abuse, maybe a terrible marriage, maybe a work environment, maybe a loss of a loved one, maybe a loss of finances, you know, all those things that happen to us, damage in relationships and so on, those stories don't go away. But because of mind-directed neuroplasticity, you cannot just, you don't have to live stuck under that as a destiny. You can, by becoming aware and then going through the neurocycle, you can actually change that because you can change, as you change your mind, you're changing your brain, you're changing what these look like, these toxic thoughts inside of your brain, you're changing your body and therefore you are directing changes into your future. And that's the beauty of neuroplasticity. You're never the same from moment to moment. And that's why I always talk about self-regulating constantly, living a mind-managed life to deal with the day-to-day issues. So for example, if you just if you have have start getting a little bit irritated with something and worked up about something and you don't manage it, the next time it's going to be so much easier to get irritated about that little thing because you wired it in. And now you maybe get irritated about something similar the next day and the next day and before you know it, it's become a toxic habit. But if you catch yourself in the moment, you can take advantage of neuroplasticity and redirect that into something constructive. If you find yourself worrying where you're going down a negative cycle where you don't progress forward where you worry and this could happen and that could happen and that could happen and you're actually growing your brain in the wrong direction because of neuroplasticity but if you grab that and work through the process of the neurocycle you can take that destructive worry say what am i worrying about why am i worrying about this and how can i take this energy that is in destructive worry and make it constructive worry so that that worry is something that is I feel like I haven't got control over or it's something that I need to change because it's actually impacting how I function. I can, instead of that being this, this black box of feeling overwhelmed, I can pull it up. I can say, okay, this is what I am worrying about. This is why I am worrying about this. This is what it's doing to me. This is how I see it playing out in my future. I can deconstruct it like that and say, okay, so those are good points. I should be concerned, but instead of going down a negative if only cycle, this happens and that happens, I'm going to say, okay, that may happen, but this could happen. And I reconceptualize it. Then I am driving neuroplasticity in the right direction and learning to get control. So neuroplasticity is a phenomenal gift. And it's not only your brain that's plastic, guys. It's also your body because your mind is embodied in your brain and your body. I keep saying it. Every experience is converted by the mind into thought trees made of memories. 
And in your brain, they look like these physical things made of proteins and chemicals that take on the structure. It's a toxic one, it's a healthy one. But in your body, it is a vibrational quantum energy field within proteins within the cell structure, changing the cell structure. And in all 37 to 100 trillion cells of your body, and in the mind, it's like a gravitational field because your mind has this, is all this energy, this gravitational, electromagnetic and quantum energy that makes up everything about you and driving how your body works on a, on, on a quantum subatomic level. And so all of those areas change and we can direct those changes. And when we direct those changes, not only do we change our brain, but we also change our body and we're changing our, our messy mind into, into, a, into a more productive healthy part. We're taking the messiness, using the messiness and reconstructing it to something. So anything that's happened to you is part of your story and it needs to be honored. But it doesn't have to be our destiny. If it is something that's holding you back because of mind-directed neuroplasticity, you can change how it plays out into your, into your future. I'm going to read you a quote that's from my new book, and it's a book that I've just written, which will be released in June next year, and you'll be hearing lots more about it. And it's to help parents help their children with their mental health, giving you hope, neuroplasticity, mind-directed neuroplasticity, the systems that I teach using the neurocycle will give you hope. And we need to be teaching our kids from as young as two and three how to manage their minds and how to recognize that an emotion is not an illness and a bad feeling doesn't mean I've got a brain disease and that not to push it down because it's going to make it even worse, but to be able to know how to create safe spaces for your children to be able to process the, the, what they're going through in the same way that we as adults do it. So I teach you in all my other materials how to do this as an adult, and then we model this for our children. So my new book is going to help you help your children as young as two and three manage their mental health. So here's a quote from this new book related to neuroplasticity and this concept of mind-directed neuroplasticity and how experiences are wired into our brain, mind, and body, and how we can change those using mind-directed neuroplasticity. Our lives are the product of our experiences, which become our individual life stories. When we give children the mental tools to meet their needs, we give them the tools to tell their own story. We can teach them that although we can't always change what happens to us, we can change what happened, how what happened impacts us and plays out in our lives. So I hope you enjoy that and listen to part eight, where I'm going to talk about how this applies to you as an adult, how important it is to focus on your individual narrative.